Good morning. This is a lecture on Chapter 17, Performance and Breach of Sales and Lease Contracts under the UCC. And it also includes a quiz on Chapter 16, which was the subject of the last lecture. Make sure that you send me your answers to the quiz before midnight on March 27th, 2020, to ensure that you receive full credit. I believe you can read the chapter outline for yourselves. Um, let me point out that Monday's lecture, which is probably another important one from the point of view of a business major, is going to cover negotiable instruments and is likely to contain a quiz on this chapter, chapter 17, as well. And no surprise, here is a quiz regarding the last lecture, chapter 16, sales and lease contracts under the Uniform Commercial Code. Question one, contracts for the sale of goods are called what? Number two, this kind of property does not come under Article two of the UCC. Number three, what test is used when both goods and services are covered by a contract? Number four, this kind of property can be seen or touched. Number five, this is one way to be considered a merchant. Number six, consumer leases involve what kind of goods? Number seven, what two types of contract do not have to state a quantity? Number eight, this is irrevocable without consideration for up to three months. Number nine, Shipping non-conforming goods can be a breach or number 10. If a sale of goods involves $500 or more, this applies. You have an answer bank. A, predominant factor. B, accommodation. C, claiming unique knowledge or skill. D, merchant's firm offer. E, personal, family, or household use. F, statute of frauds. G, tangible property. H, output and requirements. I, intangible property. And J, sales contracts. Good luck. These are the learning objectives which the author of the textbook feels are important for business majors to know. They may also conceivably form the basis of a quiz that might be given on Monday regarding this chapter that we're reviewing today. Number one, what is the perfect tender rule? What are some important exceptions to this rule? Number two, when will a buyer or lessee be deemed to have accepted the goods? Number three, what remedies are available to a seller or lessor when the buyer or lessee breaches the contract? Number four, when can a buyer or lessee revoke acceptance? And number five, what implied warranties arise under the UCC? Obligations of the seller or lessor. Tendering delivery. Tender of delivery requires that the seller or lessor gives the buyer or lessee reasonable notice to enable the buyer or lessee to take delivery of the conforming goods. Recall that conforming goods are goods that conform to contract specifications as versus non-conforming goods, which do not. 
unless the parties have agreed otherwise. The seller or lessor must tender the goods at a reasonable hour and in a reasonable manner. The seller or lessor must keep the goods available for a reasonable period of time for the buyer or lessee to take possession. And the seller or lessor must tender all goods called for by the contract in a single delivery unless the parties have agreed to deliver the goods in lots or installments. Remember, once again, that the heart of all of this material is that we're talking about what are essentially commercial transactions for the sale or leasing and delivery of goods, tangible goods. Place of delivery, non-carrier contract. If the contract does not designate the place of delivery, it should be one of the following. The seller's place of business, the seller's residence, if the seller has no business location, or the location of the goods, if both parties know at the time of contracting that the goods are located somewhere other than the seller's business or residence. Place of delivery when there is a shipment contract and the contract requires or authorizes the seller or lessor to ship the goods by a carrier, the seller or lessor must deliver the goods to the carrier, make a contract reasonable given the nature of the goods and their value for transport of the goods, obtain and promptly deliver to the buyer or lessee any documents of title necessary for the buyer or lessee to take possession of the goods from the carrier, and promptly notify the buyer or lessee that the goods are en route. Now I'm assuming that you all understand that when we're referring to a carrier, we're talking about uh, an entity or person that is going to physically transport the goods from the seller to the buyer or from the lessor to the lessee. And the reason that you have to think about this person as being uh, in the transportation business um, is essentially because some outfits, to wit Amazon, um, are not necessarily using a carrier, but may be in the business of delivering the goods themselves. Place of delivery with a destination contract. If the contract requires the seller or lessor to deliver or arrange for the delivery of the goods to a particular destination, the seller or lessor must give the buyer appropriate notice about the delivery, keep the goods available for a reasonable period of time for the buyer or lessee to take possession, and obtain and promptly deliver to the buyer or lessee any documents of title necessary for the buyer or lessee to take possession of the goods from the carrier. What is the perfect tender rule. The perfect tender rule states that if the goods or the tender of the goods fails in any respect to conform to the contract, the buyer or lessee may either accept the goods or reject the entire shipment or accept part of the shipment and reject part of the shipment. What are the exceptions to the perfect tender rule? Well, by agreement of the parties, the parties can include exceptions in their contract. They may have a right to cure 
When any tender of delivery is rejected because of non-conforming goods and the time for performance has not yet expired, the seller or lessor can notify the buyer or lessee of the seller's or lessor's intention to cure and then the seller or lessor can repair, adjust, or replace the non-conforming goods within the time for performance specified in the contract. So if the contract calls for performance by the last day of the month, there is a delivery which is considered to be in violation of the perfect temper rule on the 15th of the month. The seller or lessor will have the remainder of the month within which to attempt to cure. Even if the contract time for performance has expired, the seller or lessor can still cure if he or she had reasonable grounds to believe that the non-conforming tender would be acceptable to the buyer or lessee. If the defect is not disclosed, but if it is one that the seller or lessor could have cured, the buyer or lessee cannot later assert the defect as a defense. Substitution of carriers. When the agreed manner of delivery proves impracticable or unavailable through no fault of either party, say for example, airlines stop flying, and that was supposed to be the manner of delivery, the seller or lessor may, at his own expense, use a commercially reasonable substitute, the use of which will constitute sufficient tender. With installment contracts, if a contract requires or authorizes delivery in two or more separate lots to be accepted and paid for separately, the buyer, lessee, may reject tender only if the nonconformity substantially impairs the value of the installment and cannot be cured. Does not necessarily allow the buyer or lessee to reject more than one installment unless each of those installments uh, has a nonconformity that substantially impairs its value and cannot be cured. The entire installment contract is reached only when one or more of the non-conforming installments substantially impairs the value of the entire contract. More exceptions to the perfect tender rule. Commercial impracticability. When an occurrence unforeseen by either party at the time the contract was made makes performance commercially impracticable, the perfect tender rule will no longer apply and delays in delivery or non-delivery in whole or in part is not a breach of contract provided that the seller, lessor, notifies the buyer, lessee, as soon as practical of the delay or non-delivery. Sometimes an unforeseen event causes the seller or lessor to partially fulfill the contract. In this situation, the seller or lessor is required to distribute any remaining goods or deliveries fairly and reasonably among the parties to whom it is contractually obligated to deliver the goods. An example that we might have at the moment would be contracts for the delivery of respirator masks to healthcare facilities. In several instances, states and other local entities have actual contracts for the delivery of such masks with, from suppliers that have been effectively terminated by FEMA stepping in and ordering that the masks be delivered to FEMA rather than to the state. In those cases, obviously, uh, we have a breach on the part of the manufacturer, but it's one of the few instances that I can think of where the performance truly has been made commercially impracticable by the intervention of a federal government agency uh, in a state contract. Destruction of identified goods is another exception to the perfect tender rule. 
The parties are excused from performance when an unexpected event, through no fault of either party, destroys goods identified when the contract was formed before the risk of damage passed to the buyer or lessee. The goods are only partially destroyed. The buyer or lessee may inspect them and either cancel the contract or accept the damaged goods at a reduced price. Uh, one of the examples that can occur would be um, a tornado going through a warehouse, for example. Assurance and cooperation is another exception to the perfect tender rule. If one party has reasonable grounds to believe that the other party will not perform as agreed, she may, in writing, quote, demand adequate assurance of due performance, close quote, from the other party. Then, if such assurances are not forthcoming within a reasonable time, which is not to exceed 30 days, the failure to respond may be treated as a repudiation of the contract. If one party's performance requires the cooperation of the other party, the second party's failure to cooperate relieves the first party's obligation to perform. Obligations of the buyer or lessee. Recall again, uh, sellers and buyers are covered under Article 2 of the UCC. Lessors and lessees are covered under Article 2A of the UCC. Payment. In the absence of any specific agreement, the buyer or lessee must make payment at the time and place the goods are received. When goods are sold on credit, the buyer must pay according to the credit terms provided in the contract. When goods are leased, the lessee must make the lease payments required by the lease agreement. The buyer or lessee may pay by any means specified by the parties or by any reasonable means that the parties do not specify a method of payment. If the seller or lessor insists on cash when a buyer or lessee tenders a check or credit card, the seller or lessor must give the buyer or lessee reasonable time to obtain cash. Right of inspection. The Uniform Commercial Code requires that the buyer or lessee be given an opportunity to inspect the identified goods as a condition precedent to the seller's or lessor's right to enforce payment under the contract. Unless otherwise agreed, inspection can take place at any reasonable place and time and in any reasonable manner in light of the customs of the trade, past practices of the parties, and the like. Unless otherwise agreed, the buyer or lessee bears the cost of inspection. Acceptance. A buyer or lessee can accept the delivered goods by expressly accepting the shipment by words or by conduct. So if they're delivered to a loading dock and you say nothing but go over and take a forklift and move them on into your warehouse, that's going to be deemed to be an acceptance by conduct. Um, you can accept the delivered goods by failing to reject the goods with a, a reasonable period of time after having had the opportunity to inspect the goods. Or in the case of a sales contract, by acting in a manner inconsistent with the seller's ownership. For example, by reselling the goods to a third party. If some but not all of the goods delivered are non-conforming, and the seller or lessor has failed to cure, the buyer or lessee may make a partial acceptance, provided that the buyer or lessee cannot accept less than a single commercial unit. A commercial unit is a unit of goods that, by commercial usage, is viewed as a single whole for purposes of sale. For example, five sticks of chewing gum in a pack or a sleeve of three golf balls or a can of three tennis balls. So let's reiterate, if some but not all of the goods delivered are non-conforming and the seller or lessor has failed to cure, the buyer or lessee 
may make a partial acceptance provided that the buyer or lessee cannot accept less than a single commercial unit. Commercial unit is a unit of goods that by commercial usage is viewed as a single whole for purposes of sale, such as five sticks of chewing gum in a package or a sleeve of three golf balls. Anticipatory repudiation. If before the time for a promisor's performance, he clearly communicates to the promisee his inability or intention not to perform, the promisee may treat the repudiation as a breach and cancel the contract, treat the repudiation as a breach and sue, or wait and see if the repudiating party retracts his repudiation and performs as called for. In any case, the non-repudiating promisee may suspend her own performance unless and until the repudiating promisor performs. At any time before the non-repudiating promisee materially changes his or her position in reliance on the repudiation, the repudiating promisor may retract his repudiation and perform as and when promised. Sellers or lessors remedies where the goods are in the sellers or lessors possession and have not been transferred over to the buyer or lessee. If the buyer or lessee breaches the contract before it has received the goods, the seller or lessor may cancel the contract, giving the buyer or lessee notice of cancellation, or withhold delivery, or resell or otherwise dispose of the goods in a commercially reasonable manner. And if the goods are unfinished at the time of the breach, the seller or lessor may, if commercially reasonable, cease manufacturing the goods and dispose of them for salvage value, or complete the manufacture, resell, or dispose of the goods and hold the buyer or lessee liable for any difference between the contract price and the sale. Fourth thing that they can do, is sue to recover the purchase price or the lease payments that are due. Or lastly, they can sue to recover damages for the buyer's non-acceptance. Ordinarily, the amount of damages equals the difference between the contract price or lease payments and the market price or lease payments at the time and place of tender of the goods plus incidental damages. What are the remedies of the seller or the lessor when the goods are in transit? They've been shipped, but have not yet been delivered to the buyer or lessee. If the seller or lessor has delivered the goods to a carrier or to a bailee, but the buyer or lessee has not yet received them, the seller or lessor may, if the buyer or lessee is insolvent, stop the carrier or bailee from delivering the goods to the buyer or lessee. Or if the buyer or lessee has breached the contract but is not insolvent, then the seller can stop the carrier or bailee from delivering the goods only if the quantity shipped is at least a car load, truck load, plane load, or a larger shipment. In order to stop delivery, the seller or lessee must notify the carrier or the bailee. The seller or lessee's right to stop delivery expires if the buyer or lessee obtains possession of the goods, or the carrier or bailee acknowledges the buyer's or the lessee's right to possession, or in a sales transaction, the buyer possesses the document of title. Buyers and lessees remedies for non-delivery. If the seller or lessor refuses to deliver the goods to the buyer or lessee, the buyer or lessee may cancel the contract, relieving the buyer or lessee of any further obligations under the contract while retaining all rights against the seller lessor. 
or if she has made partial or full payment for identified goods in the possession of an insolvent seller lessor, obtain the goods by tendering to the seller lessor any remaining balance of the contract price. Or if the goods are unique and any legal remedy will be inadequate, require the seller or lessor to specifically perform the contract by tendering the identified goods to the buyer or lessee. Or if in good faith and without unreasonable delay, the uh, buyer lessee may cover, meaning to purchase or lease substitute goods from a third party, and sue to recover from the seller or less or any difference between the contract price and the price of the uh, replacement goods, plus any incidental and consequential damages, less any cost saved by the breach. Okay, as I just said, uh, among other things, the buyer seller has a right to obtain cover which is obtaining substitute goods from another seller or lessor. The um, buyer or seller also has a right, uh, if they can show that they're unable after a reasonable effort to obtain cover for the contract goods, they can replevy the goods subject to the contract. As you may recall, should recall from earlier in this course, a replevin is an action that can be used by a buyer or lessee to recover identified goods from a third party, such as a bailee who is wrongfully withholding them. Ordinarily, replevin is used in order to obtain a recovery of the goods that you've already established belong to you. This is uh, an expansion of that right. can also sue to recover the difference between the contract price and the fair market price of the goods at the time that the buyer lessee learned of the breach, plus incidental and consequential damages, less any costs that were saved. Stay with me, everybody. We're at least two-thirds of the way through. When the seller or lessor has delivered non-conforming goods, remember, these are goods that do not meet the contract specifications. So, if the seller, lessor, delivers non-conforming goods or makes a non-conforming tender, the buyer lessee, following a reasonable notice to the seller, lessor, the defects in the goods or the tender, may, doesn't have to, but may, within a reasonable period of time after delivery, reject the goods, provided that, if the rejecting buyer is a merchant and the seller has no agent or business at the time of rejection, the buyer must follow any reasonable instructions from the seller regarding the goods or lacking instructions. The buyer may sell or lease the goods in good faith or store the goods if they are non-perishable. But they have to be non-perishable. Within a reasonable period of time after the buyer, and from now on, whenever I say buyer, you see that means buyer and lessee, discovers or should have discovered a nonconformity that substantially impairs the value of the goods to her, she can revoke her acceptance of the goods as long as she accepted the goods on the reasonable assumption that any nonconformity would be cured and it has not been cured within a reasonable time, or did not discover the nonconformity prior to acceptance, either because it was not apparent or because assurances from the seller kept the buyer from inspecting the goods. If that's the case, you have to keep the goods and see for the difference between the value of the goods is accepted, if you accept them, and their value is promised in the contract as your alternative remedy in the absence of revocation of acceptance. If your student number ends with zero, sign in to prove attendance by typing the word Franklin in the comments. Spotlight on baseball cards. Case 17.2 on page 444. 
of your book. In 1995, James Fiddle attended a sports card show in San Francisco where he met Mark Streck, doing business as Star Cards of San Francisco, an exhibitor at the show. Later on, Streck's representation that a certain 1952 Mickey Mantle Tops baseball card was in near mint condition. Fiddle bought the card from Streck for $17,750. Streck delivered the card to Fiddle in Omaha, Nebraska, and Fiddle placed it in a safe deposit box. In May 1997, Fiddle sent the card to professional sports authenticators, who told him that the card was ungradable because it had been discolored and doctored. Fiddle complained to Streck, who replied that Fiddle should have returned the card with a typical grace period for the unconditional return of a card, seven days to one month of its receipt. In August, Fiddle sent the card to another grading service for a second opinion of value. They also concluded the card had been refinished and trimmed. Fiddle filed a suit in the Nebraska State Court and was awarded $17,750 plus costs. Streck appealed to the Nebraska Supreme Court, and they affirmed the decision of the lower court. Their rationale was Section 2-6073A of the Uniform Commercial Code states that where a tender has been accepted, the buyer must, within a reasonable time, after he discovers or should have discovered any breach, notify the seller or breach, or be barred from any remedy. Furthermore, what is a reasonable time for taking any action depends on the nature, purpose, and circumstances of such action. State Supreme Court concluded that the buyer, Fiddle, had reasonably relied on the seller's representation that the goods were authentic, which they were not. Fiddle had been given timely notice that when he discovered the defects. Court reasoned that the policies behind the notice requirement to allow the seller to correct the defect, to prepare for negotiations and litigation, and to protect against stale claims at a time beyond which an investigation can be completed were not unfairly prejudiced by the lack of an earlier notice to Streck. Any problem Streck may have had with the party with whom he obtained the baseball card was a separate matter from his transaction with Fiddle, and an investigation into the source of the altered card would not have minimized Fiddle's damages. Now, the questions are, what if the facts had been different and they had had a written clause requiring Fiddle to give notice if any defect in the card within seven days to one month of its receipt? Would the results have been different? Think about it. Let me know. If your student number ends with 8, enter the word Taft in the comments. Provisions that affect or limit remedies. The parties may agree to expand or limit the remedies provided by the Uniform Commercial Code. Exclusive remedies. If the contract unequivocally provides an exclusive remedy, a court should enforce it unless the circumstances cause the exclusive remedy to fail in its essential purpose. Limitations on consequential damages. The parties may also limit or exclude consequential damages as long as the limitation or exclusion is not unconscionable, given the relative bargaining strength of the parties. Statute of limitations. Under the UCC, an action for a breach of contract must be commenced within four years after the injured party knew or should have known of the breach. The parties may contractually agree to reduce this period to not less than one year, but may not extend it beyond four years. A buyer who accepts nonconforming goods must notify the breaching party of the breach within a reasonable time to permit the breaching party to cure. The buyer's failure to do so will bar any claim for breach.
If your student number ends with six, enter the word Wilson in the comments. Warranties of title. Good title. Except for disclaim seller's warrant that they have good and valid title to the goods being sold and that they may rightfully transfer title to the buyer. No liens, except where disclaimed sellers warrant that the goods they're selling are free of any liens. That is, any encumbrance on the goods to satisfy a debt or protect a claim for payment of a debt. For example, a security interest on personal property or a mortgage on real property. No infringements. This warranty of title, except where disclaimed, says that merchant sellers and merchant lessors are warranting that the goods delivered are free from any infringement claims by a third person. Recall, everybody, where infringement comes up in connection with intellectual property. If your student number ends with seven, enter the word Coolidge in the comments. Express warranties are a seller's or lessor's oral or written promise as to the quality, description, or performance of the goods being sold or leased. Under the Uniform Commercial Code, express warranties arise when a seller indicates to the buyer that the goods conform to any affirmation or promise of fact about the goods made by the seller to the buyer or by the lessor to the lessee. They conform to any description of the goods made, for example, on a label, packaging, or in a brochure, or that they conform to any sample or model of the goods shown to the buyer or lessee prior to the purchase or the lease. This affirmation, promise, description, sample, or model must become part of the basis of the bargain between the seller uh, or lessee, lessor rather, and the buyer lessee. And it must constitute more than a mere statement of opinion or value, unless the speaker is an expert on whose opinion or valuation the buyer could reasonably rely. If your student number ends with two, enter the word Taylor in the comments. There are two implied warranties that arise under the UCC. Um, a warranty that arises by law because of the circumstances of a sale and not from the seller's express promise is an implied warranty. The first is the implied warranty of merchantability. This is a warranty implied by law that the goods being sold or leased are reasonably fit for the general purpose for which they are sold or leased, are properly packaged and labeled, and are of proper quality. Um, in the case of merchantable food, it means that it's fit to be eaten. In the case of merchantable goods, it means that it's suitable and appropriate for entry into the stream of commerce. If your student number ends with four, enter the word grant in the comments. The second implied warranty is the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. This is a warranty that goods sold or leased are fit for the particular purpose for which the buyer or the lessee will use the goods. It arises from the buyer's or lessee's reliance on the skill and judgment of the seller or the lessor to select suitable goods, knowing what that purpose is. Implied warranties can also arise as a result of a course of dealing or usage of trade, such as a well-recognized trade custom. If your student number ends with nine, enter the word Hamilton in the comments. 
Okay, let's condense this one down. Webster versus Blue Ship Tea Room, Inc. A uh, lady in Boston goes and gets some fish chowder at a restaurant. She winds up swallowing a fish bone and she has to have two operations in order to, to fix this problem. Originally, she wins in the trial court and then the Blue Ship Tea Room appeals it and the um, ju Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, which is what it's called in Massachusetts instead of being called the Supreme Court, told you first couple of classes that different states call these courts different things, comes back and says, no, it did not violate an implied uh, warranty of merchantability um, because you got to expect that if somebody is making fish chowder right out of fresh fish, once in a while you're going to wind up getting a bone in it. So, I ask a different question from the question that is on the screen, which I think is just sort of silly. Uh, my question is, let's say you go to a Wendy's and you order the chili and they give you chili but it's got a human toe in the chili. Is that something that you should expect to find in chili so that it doesn't breach the implied warranty of merchantability by the restaurant? I leave that to you as a critical thinking question. If your student number ends with five, enter the word haze as in Rutherford B. Hayes, in the comments. Overlapping warranties. If two or more warranties are made in a particular transaction, they are generally cumulative, not exclusive. However, if the terms of the warranties are inconsistent with one another, then an express warranty displaces an inconsistent implied warranty but not an implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. A sample will take precedence over an inconsistent general description, and technical specifications will displace an inconsistent sample or general description. If your student number ends with one, enter the word Fillmore in the comments. Finally, warranty disclaimers. Express warranties, whether oral or written, may be disclaimed by a clear and conspicuous written disclaimer, which is called to the buyer's attention at the time that the contract is being formed. Can you potentially also disclaim the implied warranty of merchantability? Yes, and the disclaimer does not have to be written. However, it must specifically use the term merchantability. And if it is written, it must be conspicuous. I'm not going to get into the questions of proof regarding an oral disclaimer of the implied warranty of merchantability and whether or not both parties are going to remember the use of the word merchantability in that oral disclaimer. Disclaimer of the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose in order to disclaim the, that implied warranty, uh, the, war the disclaimer has to be written as well as being conspicuous, which obviously in the first case, oral remedy can't be conspicuous because it's not in writing. But in the case of the disclaimer of the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, it has to be both in writing and conspicuous. A buyer or lessee's examination or failure to expect uh, if the buyer lessee actually examines the goods as fully as desired before entering into the sales or lease contract, or if the buyer or lessee refuses to examine the goods 
at the seller's or the lessor's request, then there is no implied warranty with respect to defects that a reasonable examination either did reveal or would have revealed. This concludes this lecture for Chapter 17 uh, regarding the uh, sales and lease contract provisions under the Uniform Commercial Code. Once again, remember to answer the quiz, do say timely, and um, stay out of public places if at all possible. We'd like to be able to eventually see those of you who are uh, not graduating seniors uh, return to this campus as students again. Thank you. If your student number ends in three, enter the name Buchanan in the comments.